Good morning. It's good to be with you all on this Memorial Day weekend. And I hope in some way you're going to be able to enjoy it and, and maybe get outdoors a little bit. It'll, um, it'll do us all good to, to have some kind of a feeling of celebration uh, for this first weekend to usher in summer. Uh, wanted to let you know that uh, this is probably going to be the last kitchen table talk, at least for a while. We're going to try to make the transition into having these services, the Sunday morning service, uh, filmed from the sanctuary. Uh, that was always the intention as we began to have a little bit of hope of getting back together. We thought as a bridge, uh, a small worship team would get together and we would start having a little more traditional services and film them from the sanctuary. So Pentecost could not be a better time to do that. We're celebrating the birthday of the church. So we're going to give that a try next week. But I've certainly enjoyed all of these kitchen table talks and sharing this with you and uh, especially enjoyed Jay's Wooded Forest talk last week. I, I found that very uplifting and comforting and so appreciate Jay's uh, service in that way. So thank you. Um, as far as communion goes, uh, we may be doing that online on Sunday evenings. I'm going to talk to the session about that and uh, we'll try to let you know in this coming week's weekly update. Uh, obviously, um, we're not going to be able to do communion for some time, uh, just for safety reasons. So maybe we can continue to do that once a month online and uh, still share that sacred sacrament together. So I um, wanted to begin our service this week with kind of an unusual song. Uh, not one that you would generally think of for a church service, but it just seemed so appropriate. I know that many of us are, are getting tired and even a little bit down about uh, the effects of this pandemic and the coronavirus and the way it has restricted our lives and um, made, made hard times for so many of us. And I thought that uh, this, this old Stephen Foster song, uh, would be an appropriate song to sing today. <clears throat> Simply called, Hard Times Come Again No More. Let us pause in life's pleasures and count its many tears while we all suck a sorrow with the poor. There's a song that will linger forever in our ears. Oh, hard times come again no more. Tis the song, the sign of the weary. Hard times, hard times come again no more. Many days have you lingered around my cabin door Oh, hard times come again no more While we seek mirth and beauty and music light and gay there are frail forms fainting at the door Though their voices are silent, their pleading looks will say, Oh, hard times come again no more. Tis the song, the sigh of the weary. Hard times, hard times come again no more. Many days have you Round my cabin door, oh, hard times come again no more. Many days have you lingered around my cabin door, oh, hard times come again no more. I know that's how many of us feel, but we're not going to stay there. And 
the good times will come again. Let us go to God in prayer. And this is a prayer for Memorial Day, commemorate Memorial Day. And I would ask that you would join me at the end of it with the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. As our nation pauses to remember those in military who have given their lives for freedoms we enjoy, we pray you would have us all look to you for strength, comfort, and guidance. Be with all who serve in our armed forces and bless them and their families. Grant your loving protection. Let peace prevail among all of the nations, O oh God. Especially let your mercy rest upon our land, even as we acknowledge with thanksgiving your past goodness on this country. If it is your will, preserve the lives of the men and women in uniform as they defend our citizenry. Most of all, we pray that you would turn the hearts of all, military and civilian, to your holy word where we will find the true peace that surpasses all understanding. Keep us repentant of sin and move us to know, take hold, and treasure your saving grace. We offer these prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught his disciples when praying to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Scripture lesson that I want to use today comes from Paul's letter to the Philippians. It's the third chapter, and it's just verses 7 and 8. And he says, Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want to talk a little bit about priorities this morning. Seems like a, a relative topic. Uh, Memorial Day certainly brings up priorities. We, we have a priority of this great nation, our, our country. Um, our way of life is a high priority. Uh, the loved ones, uh, those that we have known uh, in family and friends for generations who have given their lives for the freedom that this country enjoys. Families who sacrificed their loved ones for this freedom. Men and women and, and families that continue not, not just dying for, for our country and for these great freedoms that we enjoy, but have given up their lives to be in the military, given up many opportunities and things that they would have enjoyed had they not given their lives to the military, um, continue on a daily basis to sacrifice for us, for these freedoms. They're priorities. They're priorities that we should honor and memorialize as we are this weekend. You know, a lot of our priorities in life, uh, some of these very priorities that I'm just mentioning, they they changed quickly when the coronavirus came and, and COVID-19 forced us into situations that we never imagined. We were used to, to going to work and coming home as we pleased, to, to have the freedom to choose what we did. When we did it, we could go to a restaurant to eat, we could go to movies and concerts, we could travel and visit family and friends, we could do all these things. And suddenly, with the onset of COVID-19, these options are no more. These priorities have been taken away temporarily. And now our priorities are staying well, staying safe, 
protecting our loved ones, keeping them well and safe, and even sometimes the priority of fear and worry seems overwhelming as, as we think about death and sickness for ourselves and our loved ones. It may not be a welcomed or a chosen priority, but this worry and fear can certainly become just that. Priorities can change so quickly because of circumstances. Reminds me of a, of a story that I heard once of a missionary, <clears throat> Christian missionary over in China. And uh, this was, he was there at a time of political unrest and ended up being placed in house arrest. So he had to stay in his home, he and his family. Um, it was his wife and, and two children, the four of them, had to stay in their homes under house arrest because they were Christian missionaries. Uh, we, we certainly aren't suffering from that, but we do know what it means to be confined to our homes. And, and they had been in this situation for weeks when suddenly one morning there was a knock on the door and they opened the door and there stood two fully armed Chinese soldiers and automatic weapons strapped over their shoulders. And they said, said you all will leave this afternoon. We will fly you back to the U.S. of A. And they had no idea that this was going to happen. It caught them completely by surprise. And they said, we don't have time to pack all our belongings. We have a whole house full of things. And the soldier said, you can take 200 pounds of belongings, 200 pounds of things that belong to you will be allowed. And that is all. We will be back this afternoon to collect you and your belongings and take you to the airport. Well, <clears throat> Once the shock wore off, they began to look around the house and try to decide what they were going to take back to the States. Now, the missionary's wife had a beautiful Chinese vase. She wanted to have something that would commemorate uh, the joyful part of their trip, the happiness that they had had, and wanted to take this vase. The missionary said, yes, but I just, I just purchased this new typewriter. It was expensive, and, and I don't want to leave it over here. And, of course, the kids were fighting over what toys they could take and, and whether they were being fair. And, and you know, the, the daughter and the son were each getting to pick uh, the same amount of things. And all of this discussion and arguing about priorities of belongings and possessions were going on. And, and they finally, finally settled it all out. And they, they put everything uh, on the bathroom scales and, and made sure that it came out right to 200 pounds packed it and were ready to go when the soldiers knocked on the door. Well, they opened the door and the soldiers stepped in and they looked around and they said, have you packed everything that you're going to take? And the missionary said, yes, we have. And the soldier said, did you weigh it? And the missionary said, yes, sir. It, it weighs exactly 200 pounds. And the soldier looked at the missionary and said, did you weigh the children? You weigh the children. And in a split second, everything that had been a priority before them changed. It's a way that it can happen, the way that it often happens. Paul, Paul in our scripture this morning, when he's talking about how he's given up everything for Christ just before this part, this passion or, or passage of scripture, excuse me, just before that, Paul was bragging about being a Hebrew of Hebrews, about what a great righteous person he was. Before, Paul was saying, all my priorities were wrapped up in my heritage, in my culture, in my family. And he also had a lot of priorities in his education. Paul was an extremely well-educated Jew, and he had that reputation. One of his priorities was how he was seen by his fellow Jews, his reputation. And then he had an experience that we all know on the road to Damascus. And in a split second, in a split second, all of Paul's priorities, former priorities, went out the window. After he had that encounter with Jesus Christ, Paul had one priority one priority only, and that was Christ. He said everything else, everything else, 
simply rubbish. That's not the best translation of that word. If you go to the Greek and, and look at the word that uh, they have translated as rubbish, the word is skubala. And it can mean rubbish, it can mean trash, but what it really means is dung, manure, skubala. You can say that, that, and I think Paul would say, before he met Jesus Christ, he was full of, of skubala. And, and after Christ, everything that he cared about, everything that he held at this high level of priority was just dung. It was manure. It was scuba life. So this all begs the question, doesn't it? What are our true priorities? You know, the old saying is, if you want to see what you really care about, look at your checkbook or check your schedule calendar. You know, that may not be the best way to check this right now during this pandemic, during this lockdown, but this lockdown does give us a chance to step back and take a, a long, hard look at the way we have been living our lives and think about what we hold as our real priorities, not just what we think they are, but the way we live into what truly are our priorities. I think this is an excellent time to take stock of that because you have to be careful what your real priorities are. There was a theology professor from a seminary in Louisville that back in the late 60s during the Vietnam War, his son had been drafted and was serving in the army in Vietnam. And this seminary professor very learned man, very, uh, uh, you know, knew the Bible, knew, was a very deeply uh, faithful Christian. He said that he, he began to notice that thinking about his son, understandably so, was becoming very central to the, his life. He would wake up in the morning and he would think about whether his son was safe or not. I mean, it's so easy to understand. How could you not? And then he would come home from lunch and he would, um, while he was eating, he would check the mail and see if there was a letter from his son, hoping and hoping that he would find some news of, of how his son was doing. When he would come home in the evenings, his wife and he would sit around dinner and talk about their son. And it soon became that he couldn't even sleep at night for worrying about whether his son safe. All of which is so understandable. And yet this, this professor, this theology professor, realized that what he was doing was he was beginning to process every aspect of his life through this one relationship. Everything, every aspect of his life was being focused through this lens of his relationship with his son. And he finally had to admit that as good and honorable and holy as his love for his son was, it had become an idol. It had become an idol in his life. Because you see, an idol is whatever is absolutely central to our lives. An idol is... is anything that our lives revolve around. Or another way to put it is, an, an idol is, is that one thing, that one thing without which our lives would be disorganized, that we would lose the organization and the structure of our lives if you extracted this one thing. That one thing is an idol. Good things. Good things can become idols. We all know that family, family can become an idol. Careers can become an idol. We don't mean them to be. We may not even look at them as, but they can take that place and become that central. Even church, church can become an idol. As crazy as that may seem, good things, good things can become idols if we're not careful. Certainly bad things can, sins, temptations, 
anger and bitterness. We've all known people who can only see life through anger and bitterness. And that, that emotion has become an idol for them. Worry and fear can do the same thing. It can become the very center of our lives. And when it does that, it is an idol. And I'd like, to, I'd like to remind myself and all of us that we need to guard against letting this pandemic, letting coronavirus become an idol in that way in which it becomes the very center of our life, the lens through which we see our lives. And it's hard. It's hard not to let that happen because we are just bombarded by the media. Everything we listen to and look at has to do with coronavirus. It's on everyone's minds. We cannot have a conversation without bringing it up. It affects every aspect of our lives, but it does not have to be central. It does not have to be an idol. Because the only thing, as Paul has so eloquently pointed out, the only thing that should be central to our lives is Jesus Christ. And if we keep Jesus at the center, then our faith will produce a peace that passes all understanding. It will produce a peace beyond any information, any vaccine, any cure, any circumstance. A peace that passes all understanding. Because we can take that faith and put our hope Jesus, not in the things seen, not in all the all the newscasts and the signs and, and the things that we see every day. No, we place our hope in the unseen, in the world of spirit, in God, in Jesus. And that will lead us to love. Love, perfect love casts out all fear. That's what Jesus has to offer. That's what keeping Jesus in the center of our lives can promise. No matter what, no matter the situation we're in, no matter what we're dealing with, if we are keeping Jesus Christ at the center, then we will reap these rewards. I want to close out today with a prayer that I thought was particularly um, appropriate. This is a prayer that I've shared with you before, I believe. Uh, it's a prayer by Thomas Merton. It's a famous prayer. Thomas Merton was uh, one of the greatest spiritual leaders of the 20th century, as many of you know. And uh, yet he was a very humble man. He was very down to earth. And he's very easy to relate to. Um, because I think we have all felt and, and probably do feel now the feelings that he expresses in this prayer. Let us pray. My Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end. Nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, I will trust you always. Though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death, I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we started with hard times, come again no more. And I want to leave you with a little more cheerful song. This is 
is one that you'll sing with me, I hope. Uh, it's one that we all know. It's the doxology. And, and you've probably never heard it on a banjo before, but um, it seems to me like a lot of times when we sing the doxology, we don't sing it in a way that's sad, but, but it's not as happy and joyful as the words would lead us to believe it should be. And I think the doxology on the banjo is pretty much expressive of the happiness and the joy that this song that we all know expresses. So we'll see what you think. This is the doxology. I'll play it through twice and sing it with me. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly Bless you, and we'll see you in the sanctuary for Pentecost next Sunday. Have a great week. Enjoy your Memorial Day weekend, and thank you. Thank you for being here.